Laryngoscopy is a skill used to intubate patients in a number of clinical scenarios, ranging from the emergency room to the operating room. The more common indications include surgery requiring general anesthesia, airway protection, and respiratory failure. Here we present laryngoscopy from the perspective of an anesthesiologist in the operating room. Ensuring that airway equipment is available prior to the procedure is critical to a successful intubation. Obtain two laryngoscopes with blades and check to ensure that the light bulbs and batteries are working. You will also need an oral airway, a nasal airway, a dental guard, lubricant, an appropriately sized endotracheal tube with stylet, and a 10 milliliter syringe. A tongue depressor is optional. Select a laryngoscopy blade based on your experience, airway exam, and patient anatomy. In most situations, the glottic opening can be successfully visualized with a Macintosh or a Miller blade. You will also need to choose an appropriately sized endotracheal tube. The majority of female patients will use a size 7 tube, and the majority of male patients will need a size 8 tube. Test the cuff on the endotracheal tube by inflating it with 10 milliliters of air using a syringe. If no leaks or defects are detected, deflate the air completely. To prepare your endotracheal tube for intubation, secure the connector in place. If you do not plan to use a stylet, you can bend the tube in the form of a circle. Although curving the tube is not mandatory, some practitioners recommend this step because it can facilitate tube placement through the vocal cords. If you choose to use a stylet, it should be lubricated with surgilube and placed inside the endotracheal tube. Place the stylet inside the tube. The stylet should not extend past the Murphy eye hole of the endotracheal tube. Fold the stylet over the edge of the tube to fix it in place. Then bend the tube at a 35 degree angle in the shape of a hockey stick. Induction of anesthesia is initiated while the patient breathes 100% oxygen. After ensuring that the patient can be successfully ventilated using a mask, you may proceed with the laryngoscopy. The patient should be placed in a supine position with his or her head resting on a foam pillow. Raise the table such that the patient's oral aperture is level with the physician's xiphoid cartilage. To protect the patient's teeth, place a dental guard over the upper incisors. With the laryngoscope blade extended, grip the distal part of the handle in your left hand. Stand at the head of the bed and scissor open the oral aperture with your right hand. Gently sublux the jaw. Insert the blade into the patient's mouth to the right of midline. Gently sweep the tongue to the left, ending the motion when the laryngoscope is aligned in the middle of the mouth. Advance the blade, looking for the epiglottis and vollecula. When the tip of the blade enters the vollecula, Use the handle to lift upward and outward, such that the blade handle points toward the ceiling corner. Visualize the glottic opening. The Macintosh blade tip sits in the vollecula such that the epiglottis and glottic opening are visualized. Stand at the head of the bed and scissor open the oral aperture with your right hand. Grip the distal part of the blade handle in your left hand. Insert the blade into the right side of the patient's mouth. In contrast to the Macintosh blade, displace the tongue to the left while keeping the blade itself slightly to the right of midline. When the epiglottis is visualized, advance the tip of the blade under the epiglottis. Lift the blade handle, moving the epiglottis and soft tissue out of your plane of view. Visualize the glottic opening. If you have difficulty obtaining a view of the glottic opening, an improved view of the vocal cords can be achieved by using these techniques. Exert backward, upward, and rightward posterior pressure on the thyroid cartilage. Exert posterior pressure on the cricoid cartilage. 
By placing 30 newtons or less of posterior pressure on the cricoid cartilage, the glottic opening will move into your line of view, enabling you to better visualize the vocal cords. Unlike the location of the Macintosh blade, the Miller blade tip sits under the epiglottis. Here, the epiglottis is not visualized. Only the glottic opening is seen. Place the endotracheal tube in the right side of the mouth, advancing it toward the glottic opening. The tube should not obscure your view of the glottic opening, and you should watch the tube pass through the vocal cords. If a stylet is used, it should be removed immediately after the endotracheal tube passes through the cords. Continue to insert the tube to a depth 2 centimeters above the carina. From an endoscopic viewpoint, you can appreciate the appropriate depth of the endotracheal tube in relation to the carina. From the central incisors, the average depth of the endotracheal tube is 21 centimeters in a female patient and 23 centimeters in a male patient. Carefully remove the blade, inflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube with a clean syringe using the minimum volume of air needed to prevent a leak. Connect the endotracheal tube to the breathing circuit. Provide a gentle breath with the reservoir bag, not to exceed 25 centimeters of water pressure. Confirm successful ventilation by watching for chest rise and auscultating the lungs bilaterally. Verify ventilation by checking the monitor for the presence of N-tidal carbon dioxide. Remove the dental guard and inspect the teeth for incidental damage. Secure the tube with tape. Fix the tape to the patient's cheek and upper lip around the endotracheal tube and again to the upper lip and opposite cheek. 